Wonder Soul. Wonder Soul. Wonder Soul. Wonder Soul. Welcome everyone to the podcast. Uh, I know it's been a while. Uh, it's the first show back in a couple months, if not a lot longer. But if you have listened to the podcast before in the past, then you are familiar with Kenny Mason, the founder and creator of Ghost Planet Studios. Welcome, Kenny. Welcome back. What's up, man? How have you been? Hey, hey it's good to be back on uh, Wonder Soul. I've been good, man. A lot of good stuff going on uh, in our corner of the galaxy, so to speak. Um, it's good to be back. Good to be back and talk with you here. Yeah, definitely, dude. And I know like we've talked, you know, in between this time and we, we stay in touch and we follow each other and whatever we're doing, man. Um, for, for people that may be tuning in for the first time, uh, would you like to just kind of give a rundown of what you work on, what you do, what's Ghost Planet all about? And then we'll get into some like cool geeky talk and go from there, man. Let's do it. And uh, I'll be succinct as well. So Ghost Planet is a setting. It is a transmedia narrative of a place that has characters and a story to it that I tell in many different ways. We do have a quote unquote podcast available on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Stitcher, Podbean, places like that. That is a drama and covers what the different characters on this planet get into. Some of it's horror and they're fighting off monsters. Some of it are reviews where they're reviewing um, video games from Earth, you know, like things we grew up with, like Resident Evil 2, more modern uh, music reviews, even like albums that have come out pretty recently. So it's a nice mix, almost like a mystery science theater 3000 type deal, but uh, with a little cooler than that. Um, and we've now moved into doing a digital TCG, a card game called uh, Sector Saints, where we're taking a bunch of our characters and lore and making a card game out of that that's available online. And we're working on the kinks there. And we've got a webcomic coming um, for those characters as well. And we, we, we've got some musical stuff in the works too. So it, it's just a big setting that spans across social media. It has tons of lore and cool characters. And I'm interested in getting that stuff out there however we can. And that's what I do. And that's what we do. Man, you do so much, dude. And I've always respected it. And uh, I'm always blown away when you come up with uh, more ideas and you actually execute them, too. So I definitely got to give you credit there, dude. And um, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about with you uh, to start off, just given all the things that you do uh, work on and create on a weekly, monthly, daily basis is... Um, what would you say, man, is like the hardest challenge for you as a creator? Like, what is the what is the thing that you face? Uh, maybe it's an insecurity. Maybe it's like something uh, in 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 the process that you find that's really hard to do, uh, especially when you're moving from different mediums and stuff, man. Like, what what do you think the biggest challenge is for doing Ghost Planet? The biggest challenge, um, I would have to say we, we've we been fortunate in that uh, we do do a lot of, of things that one might say are unique, uh, like these cards and things like that, but it's really a challenge reining in my ambition as far as what we really should focus time and money on and what we shouldn't um there have been shows uh like gp after dark which i wanted to be like a talk show format like a, a conan jay leno type deal and i would still like to do that someday but it just wasn't a good fit for the type of content um that ghost planet was putting out so there there are things that don't get made and i think really that's the biggest challenge when you're when you're making something like this i've been fortunate enough to come up with a place that people get interested in and come up with characters that people are starting to get invested in and whether that's uh through the visuals that we make the because we at this point we've been around for a few years and um our characters have twitter accounts and things like that that people follow so it's been easy to get that out there, but we can't make everything and, and not every idea is a good idea. So, you know, there are some things that I just, I have to rein in and say, okay, well maybe we shouldn't do this. So that, that that's probably the biggest challenge is keeping it honest and reining in ambition 
um, even with a platform where lots of it comes from just raw ambition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and obviously, quality over quantity, you know, like when you're doing a lot of different stuff, you, you, you get super excited about an idea. And I can tell with you, man, like when we've had conversations, like everything that you've ever brought up to me, you seem very passionate about. So I know it's got to be difficult sometimes to be able to come to that conclusion and go, okay, maybe, maybe even if it's, um, just not right now, let me focus on this. Let me go over here and do this before I get to that or something along those lines. Like, so I know it can be challenging, uh, especially when you want to do so much, man. And you mentioned the cards, dude, and I saw those, or I saw one of them that you uh, posted on Twitter. And uh, so I, I I played Pokemon, collected Pokemon cards. I played Magic. I think uh, there was a Dragon Ball Z card game, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, all these card games. Like, where did the inspiration for that come from, man? Like, uh, what card games did you play growing up? Or do you even play any card games today, like Magic? Or uh, what's that one that's uh, digital only by Blizzard? Hearthstone? Isn't that the one? That, yeah, yeah, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good question. I played almost all of those games growing up. <laughs> <laughs> do I play them now? No, I don't really have the time to play, play card games now. Um, but I played them growing up too. I mean, I started with uh, the Pokemon TCG. I was born in 1991. Like I, I was, I was there. I lived during Pokemon Fever. It's like I, I could not play that card game. You now I have tons of memories of trading for rares and shinies and getting cheated out of good cards for cards I thought would be good because <laughs> they were holographic. You know, down to to buying the Southern Island set from Target and impressing everyone in my neighborhood because they didn't know where I got it. You know, having my dad in the infancy of eBay troll along these sketchy sellers to find me a Japanese Charizard. You know, I've, I've, I've really been there. And when Yu-Gi-Oh! came around, like when Yu-Gi-Oh! first started, I got in on that on the ground floor. You know, I had like a Blue Eyes deck when that was um, still a, a little cool. And I, I remember teaching other people in my class how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! before, before um, any of them knew. So I have history with that, that too. I didn't play Magic the Gathering, but I was very aware of it. Um, I just really, it took me a long time to get into the type of conceptualism Magic had going on because Magic is very similar to what I have now. Like it is a setting, and the cards, very similar to what my cards are for. They give you the, a glimpse into this greater, wider world and every card you see just gives you another little piece of the place all this stuff is coming from. I think that's one of the reasons people get so attached to Magic and not that these other card games don't have staying power because they're all still around, but I, I think Magic has such a, a dedicated following from, from older players is, is because it is this, this type of world. It's the exact same type of thing I'm doing with the Sector Saints TCG. Um, I would even go so far as to say, despite the fact Magic is the game I have the least experience with, it is the card game that most influenced Sector Saints because, I, you know, you're meant to... Um, there's a little bit of Pokemon in there, a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh in there too. Um, you're you're re meant to really build a deck around a crew of characters, you know, whether that be a small group of three or five. You're meant to have certain organizations sponsor you, a very cyberpunk uh, type deal there. So Ghost Planet Studios is a sponsor card. Um, Lilat Systems, GP Freedom, Lambda Core, these are, these are companies, Spectral Labs that are sponsor cards and will sponsor character cards like the one you saw. Um, then you have location cards like uh, uh, Sector 8 is a location card like that. It just different things as, as I sat down and sort of really develop, you know, different aspects of a TCG I considered. And a lot of it does come from magic just because it seems like Wizards of the Coast first goal was to come up with an intriguing world that you get glimpses of through these cards. And I took a lot of inspiration from that methodology. Yeah, man, like the card games are still popular today. Uh, Pokemon is crazy hard to find. I, I have a, a handful of buddies that still collect them, do pack openings, you know, play the trading card game. And dude, you go to a Walmart, Target, wherever you're 
probably even your local comic book shop uh and they're they're just gone dude like these big streamers and youtubers started buying up the classic sets and showing off their holographic charizards and stuff man and it's just like it's so crazy how like that card game and just that in general has been able to last like 20 25 years and 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 how it's so hard to find but um you know collectors are uh, super cool in my eyes because like whether it's comic books trading cards uh you know anything games even you know i feel like people just have this like really cool attraction to the things that they love and and that they can hold on to and and, and are valuable that will you know hold up years down the road and um yeah dude it's funny though you mentioned Yu-Gi-Oh. And Yu-Gi-Oh is interesting because it's the whole premise is based off of the card game, right? The anime, everything is like on the cards. And I feel like for some reason that was the one that didn't really take off as much as I thought it would versus Pokemon that had a show, the video games, obviously. And, and I feel like Magic holds up, like you said, with all older audiences, because even when I was going to my local comic book shop as a kid, when Pokemon just took off, they would have like tournaments on the weekends. It'd be like a Saturday afternoon. The owners would uh, bring in pizza. You could buy like a, a slice for a dollar. And then you would also like put in to uh, do these tournaments. But, uh, you know, they would also have like a, a group there uh, that would be playing Magic. And Magic is still very popular and has like a really strong base, uh, both online now, because I feel like a lot of these card games are making that transition and i just can't get over like i i love the convenience of playing something online when it comes to card games and i know like hearthstone is like primarily if not only online and it's it's actually pretty fun um but yeah i love feeling the the cards in my hands you know i like putting them in sleeves and having you know shuffling your decks and stuff like that like i really enjoy that so um when you told me about the card idea and and now that you're doing it i thought that was really really cool man um so i will tell you i um despite all of that stuff even though i didn't mention hearthstone once it's a huge inspiration too i mean i played a good bit of hearthstone um like in 2018 i want to say there was a moment like a couple months where i got real caught up uh, i forget what new expansion dropped for them or, or something but it was just such a, a, a flashy, fun looking game. And I'm actually really caught up on the World of Warcraft lore. I stay current with that. And so it just had this extra lore where like, I was like, oh, I want to build, I want to build like a deck around uh, favorite characters of mine. I want to make like an Anduin deck. And like, you, you know, I just, it was cool that you could build a deck around a character that you like from Warcraft and do different things to support them and you could play cards only from the things that you liked if that's what you wanted Hearthstone was really cool and i actually have taken um a lot of inspiration in the way i want to roll out these cards from hearthstone uh, because even though it'll probably take me quite some time to have enough cards out to go all right now you can play it now like <laughs> there are enough cards <laughs> to build real decks and play each other in like a mobile game um while it'll take a while to get there hearthstone when you open a pack of hearthstone cards oh, it feels really good it feels really good yeah. it's, it's designed to feel that way um you know they've made it that way on purpose but just the, the way all the lights and colors go off and phone vibrates and you see all the cool cards and they're all shiny and you flip them over it's just a whole thing and while i can't implicate that necessarily um what we can do is different themed booster packs where it's a certain group of characters and the booster has a name and a, a little cover art like it's a real pack and the cards have backs to them that you can see and there is a rarity system and there are going to be holographic cards we, we really me and the the artists that are collabing for this we really spent a lot of time talking back and forth about the way the cards need to look and how they're going to play off of each other and the different uh, types and colors that they'll be what a holographic digital card even looks like and you know I'm, we're going all into this like basically i i got tired of having all of these characters that haven't been able to come into this story 
because we've largely been doing audio releases and that takes time and that takes money. Um, they're just, you know, there's tons and tons of, of writing and characters and lore that are just waiting. And, you know, I, I want to get this stuff out here somehow before I get hit by a bus or something. And, <laughs> and, a, and a, a digital card game like a Hearthstone is a really cool way to do um, the first booster, the Fright Night booster. That's going to have uh, um, a Frost, Suto, Nova, Rajma, and Tear Crease in it. I'm really excited about a holographic tier crease card because you know, that's the that's the their first big villain and what's what's fun to me is that while the story isn't far enough along where i can even really talk about this right if i put out um that first booster the fright night booster and it has these characters and it has this villain that allows me to talk about yeah this is the midnight crew this is gp's avengers they came together on this ship called Starship Ventax to repel an invading AI called Tear Crease. This is what she looked like. This is what her powers were. And these are the characters that came together to repel her and became a team after that. Like, I get to talk about those things with, with a bunch of really cool cards behind them where you get a lot of neat info on the characters and they all have little quotes that tell you about them. And I, I'm really excited about going in this direction um, so Hearthstone's been a big inspiration too. I, I had to give them credit for how they roll out their content. Yeah, especially in this like digital mobile app, you know, uh, way of doing things, especially with card games and stuff like that. And uh, you can even say that uh, video games have taken inspiration from our nostalgia for opening Pokemon packs and stuff like that uh, with like loot boxes and something like a game mode in madden like madden ultimate team is basically you open up packs of football players and you can put them in the game and you use them uh to compete with uh you know friends or strangers so there's that yeah like you said about hearthstone like the vibration the lights the sounds everything and it it uh just is and that's why like watching people opening packs of pokemon is almost as satisfying as doing it yourself you're just like ooh, what are they gonna get like that you know that whole vibe is um it, it's very nostalgic man and and that was something else i wanted to talk to you about man and just in general um like how much do you think nostalgia comes into play when you're creating something like how much uh stuff from like your childhood and things that you enjoyed growing up have found their way into the things that you like to create i feel like a a, a ton of it I, I i at this point i feel like we are especially someone who's making something like what i am making um and, and lots of internet creators really we're almost defined by the experience we had as kids the different movies that stuck with us the tv shows that stuck with us the moments from those shows that stuck with us what what's interesting to me is the longer we live you and i i think i'm starting to notice um those things in other creators i'm starting to see oh they must have saw that episode of this and they loved that moment because they're playing it up big in their thing and and they they're just that's starting to happen more i feel like it's inevitable and it's the same for me um it's a lot of nostalgia i mean you know ghost planet openly is a setting that is aware of earth earth isn't aware of it but it's aware of earth and you know because they're so far away they aren't getting all the most current stuff and that is in one way um a way for me to have them like things from the 90s and from the 2000s from when you and i were kids and were teenagers so that i can revisit some of those things review them unpack them uh, talk about them what have you it completely informs it um the main reason i started doing any of this was, was the nostalgia I, i'm not sure why but i just have this really all of my memories of the things i liked as a kid were really vivid really vivid and i, I think it's because like a lot of people in the u.s you know my parents were, were getting a divorce while i was growing up so there was a, a lot of time spent in front of the tv in front of video games in front of a computer so I just absorbed so much of, of what I saw. And I'm fortunate, really fortunate that the stuff I resonated to most was really good stuff, just unequivocally, you know, like Samurai Jack and, and 
Toonami and Dragon Ball Z, just things that we know to be absolute badass good things. We grew up with so much of that stuff. That I think a lot of my success is, is owed to having been there uh, like you were and having seen all that cool stuff that was there in the 90s and the early 2000s that all these creators did right. Um, so I think nostalgia plays a huge role in it, especially for us creators online. I think it drives a lot of us. Yeah, absolutely, dude. And I was literally watching, I didn't finish it, but I watched uh, this documentary on Netflix the other night called The Last Blockbuster. And um, it's it's pretty interesting, especially if you're a fan of like VHS, DVDs, like going to the video store, renting video games back in the day. And I have a lot of fond memories of that. Not specifically Blockbuster because it was in a town near me and uh, I would go there more than likely on the weekends when we would just get done grocery shopping. We'd swing over. It's like, all right, you guys can rent a movie or a game. You know, and uh, or if I was at a friend's house that lived in that town and we had a few mom and pop sh uh, shops that, you know, stayed open long after Blockbuster had closed and stuff like that. And um, watching that and just hearing people talk about those experiences and the nostalgia that people have for that form of media. And it made me think like weirdly about how much of now, like me and you are the same age, grew up in the 90s. Uh, the early 2000s had a huge impact on us. Um, there was a lot of things that we did that we had to leave the house to go experience, right? And I, I even follow this TikTok account that will show you POVs of like, hey, show me McDonald's when they had the Nintendo 64 in their playroom. You know, show me a Scholastic book fair, you know, things like that. And, it, and it's crazy how they find those things. But I'm like... You know, but now everything's so digital. Like you order your food, it gets dropped off at your house from DoorDash. You watch your movies on streaming services. You play your games without having to wait in line at midnight at GameStop for midnight releases. Uh, your movies are now, well, obviously it's a unique situation, but like, you know, Godzilla versus Kong and something we had talked about a little bit uh, before we started recording about Mortal Kombat, and all those things that are coming out on HBO Max, they're going to be in your living room or in your bedroom. And I wonder how the generations that are growing up now, are they going to be nostalgic for like the experiences from home? And just thinking about like you were talking about growing up, going through a divorce and stuff. And we've all have, we all have something like that. I think that we can relate to and we're going out and leaving home brought us some escapism, even though we had things at home like video games and stuff, but I wonder what they're going to be nostalgic for because a lot of our nostalgia comes from these locations, these events and those experiences. And I feel like the next thing that we're going to be talking about 10, 20 years from now that people will reference just like Blockbuster will be something like a GameStop where, yeah, people trashed Blockbuster because of late fees, things like that. And Obviously, we have our gripes with GameStop and stuff like that, but I feel like just having those stores, those places that you can walk in, the smell, the atmosphere, and um, you know how I long to walk down the aisles of a video store and just, I, I just remember as a kid, man, like picking up a horror movie and picking it out just because of the cover alone and how much inspiration I draw from that whenever I do things that I can make thumbnails or cover art for and you know oh, it's got to look cool man you know CD albums and stuff how many times you would pick something out just because of the title and the look and it might be trash right it might be the worst video game movie uh, album you ever heard but it looked cool and it, you would only find those experiences um, just by stumbling upon those and I feel like that's a little bit harder with the internet um, and a lot of our experiences are that way now and how hard it is to pick out a movie on Netflix versus if you were at the store and it's like, Hey, you can only pick one and, and go ahead. We were about to leave. So I, how much of what we do today is going to have that same vibe. I mean, everybody's just on the internet and on Twitch and TikTok, and they're just in their homes or just like locally. So is it going to be more of like that? 
you know, like thinking back to like, yeah, I remember when I was playing video games at home with my friends or, you know, watching these streams or doing these things like versus like, hey, remember when your birthday party was at Burger King or at, or at uh, you know, Chuck E. Cheese or something, stuff like that, man. Is it is it going to be different or is that just part of growing up, man? Like, I don't, I don't know. I think it, I think it's I think it's part of growing up. And I think I think one thing I um, I don't know, I, I have a weird like personal ageism where I'm like conscious not to let myself become the old guy in the room. I don't know what it is. Like we, you become him anyway, but I like fight it internally. Um, and what I mean by that, I guess it's like, I try to avoid boomer mentalities to, <laughs> to just play into the internet's game. I try to avoid boomer mentalities or at least, at least check myself when I feel like I'm, I'm exhibiting that mentality. And, really it's that all of those everything you just said is true the only thing that we have to remove when we're talking about that type of stuff because we're viewing it through the lens of two 30 year olds and and the word to remove there is just you know, we we view it as they're just sitting at home they're just on the internet they're just browsing netflix but they don't see that just you know to them they're browsing netflix making memories watching movies or they're online talking with their friends using FaceTime. You know, it's 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 not a just. The there's this mentality that I get it to an extent. Um, that you know, you know, phone bad, but it's like the 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 more I go on, the less I think that because it's it's it's, it's you know, things are always going to be changing. Things are always going to evolving. It's going to be evolving. There there are literally people working at NASA right now who their stated mission is to try to make Star Trek real. They, they are working hard. They study laboriously to try to make Star Trek closer to being real. And they're real people. And it, it it's like, you know, everything is going to change. And the fact that we can do so much stuff online now, um, you and I sort of have a foot in both time periods and that we remember before there was a lot of this stuff we were young enough to adapt to it when there was and i think you know the the, the kids coming up now i mean they're gonna think about it there's gonna be a generation of kids who remember that they were stuck inside for a million years because of the pandemic you know you you, you perceive time differently when you're older and I, for us it was a year and some you know basically a year and it felt like it, but to a kid, think about how long a year feels. Yeah. You now think about how long summer vacation used to feel. Felt like forever until you only had like a week left. <laughs> Up until then, it felt like it was a million. Oh God, every day was just an adventure and you made the most of it. It felt like you just, but what, what is a weekend during summer vacation? You know, it's all the weekend. It ends. Think about the fact that most of those kids spent a year stuck in the house. There'll be a whole generation that comes up where their memories are hanging inside because of this crazy thing going on. They might not even remember the pandemic itself that well, but they'll remember that this was part of their childhood. I, I think it's that, you know, as much as I love everything we grew up with and I do, my whole platform's based on it. Um, my whole platform's based on those member berries. It's, it's like I have checked myself to the point where I realize it was just a period of time. It was it, the, the 90s and the 2000s are to me what the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s were to my father. As special as those times were to him, uh, these times are to us, and they'll be just as insignificant to the kids of tomorrow as the 70s are to you and me. Um, so I don't know, man. You know, yeah. it's just like, it's it's all it's all cool. I get we're all in our phones now, but I don't think that's such a bad thing anymore. It's like, I at first I did, but it's just the way things are. And it's not going to change. It's going to go further in this direction. It's like, you know, you, 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 you can either move with it or you can hang back and be left further and further and further behind by the rest of the world. And I, 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 I don't want to be left behind. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I love your perspective, man. I just uh, been thinking about that, especially after seeing that documentary. And I guess for me, when I look back at the transition that even though we were getting older and this is a natural thing, 
I'd look at, uh, well, we had specific locations for specific things. And now in this age of information, you know, everything's in one place and it's convenient, but I think that's why we were able to really soak up these moments a lot more because we were not as distracted. Like we were in the moment when you were at the movie theater watching that movie you that's all you were doing when you're at home even if you are invested sometimes you'll pick up your phone you'll just get up you know uh well hey we'll just pause this like i think they released some information i wish i could pull up the numbers right now about how many people actually sat down and watched the whole snyder cut in the first week but you know but that was also made differently that's probably a bad example but it, it, regardless i just think about like when you go to blockbuster you know, it's different than browsing Netflix from the comfort of your own home and how you might just be distracted because like in this age of information, which is a blessing in a lot of ways. And it allows us to share this conversation to as many people that want to uh, listen to it, you know, and I, and I really enjoy the uh, benefits of technology and what it's done for us. It's allowed you to create some amazing things and share them with so many people. Um, but, but the reason why I don't know if it's just like looking back and being nostalgic and looking through those lens, but I just feel like you were able to be in the moment more because you were there for a specific reason. And now with every, well, you, well, you were, you yeah. were, you were, I don't think you're wrong there. I, you were, and the world was different. You know, I, I, I saw a picture the other day of a kid in his room in what must have been maybe 97 with an N64 Pokemon Stadium 1 on his TV. I knew he was in the Poke Cup because he was using I, I, just the, the whole room from the posters to the bedspread. It was a bedspread we all had. I you know the world in that picture doesn't exist anymore, but I remember what it was like. And, and that I think that's what it is, man. I think that's our nostalgia. The world and how people interacted with it dramatically changed. Like our grandparents are on these many computers in their pockets. Some of our grandparents are really good at it, surprisingly. And it's it's like, you know, who would ever have met? Like think about when we were young, how clueless our parents were about like the video games we were playing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, anything we were interested in as a kid, they were like, oh, you winning son? You know, it was, it was always something like that. but now everyone's so plugged in you can literally go are you winning grandpa and it'll be like ah the damn candy keeps going away before i can <laughs> you know like that's the yeah. reality and we because of our generation having one leg in each each of these worlds we have real nostalgia and people older than us have it too right and so that i'll grant them that older generations probably also have it they probably have it a few times over but we're we're still young enough to not just remember the world the way it was, but enjoy the way it is now too, and, and adapt to it. And you no, know, I, I completely understand. Like you used to be able to really be in a moment. I, mean, I remember, do you remember hit clips? Uh, is it the little like sound bite or the one song keychain thing? Exactly right. It okay, was a little yeah. mini boom box that was a keychain that you would put these tiny mini lookalike <laughs> CDs in. It would play like 30 seconds through these terrible grainy speakers of a song and i just remember being four kids in a neighborhood in like 2002 or something in the middle of a street but pressing <laughs> that thing over and over and over just dancing the like oh my <laughs> some gosh Nelly song or something man like you want to talk about living in the moment like, <laughs> just sit there pressing this thing playing the same clip of this song over and over and over <laughs> because it's it's what we had. There were no iPhones. Like, you know, no one had a Walkman. So it's just uh, what we had. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You had NSYNC, Christina Aguilera, uh, like Harry all of those. Yeah, all those pop, you know, artists were on that. I remember that, man. But you're talking about a Walkman, dude. Uh, I mean, I remember just riding to school and I had my uh, portable CD player. It took double A's, had those crappy headphones and listening to Linkin Park reanimation before and after school and just like, but like, that's what I'm saying, I guess, is the dedication. Like I didn't have the ability, 
I mean, I could, sure, I could pack my backpack with like five different CDs, right? But how you got really intimately close with certain things because you were so honed in on that one album, that one movie. Now it's so easy just to like switch back and forth. And I've heard like the biggest thing now with this, and I, I've said it before, the age of information and having all of this out there is the ability to maintain your attention. You know, they keep saying like, oh man, everybody's attention spans are getting worse every year. Like nobody enjoys long form content. Well, that's not true. You know, I mean, like there, there's definitely, um, you know, people that really enjoy listening to three hour long podcast or they prefer the extended cut of Lord of the Rings. Right. You know, it's just like, yeah, I understand in the, in the vine TikTok era that we're in where you have six seconds to a minute videos to just kind of you can just go through over and over and over again um it's it's different but i also feel like things made a bigger impact because you know you didn't have the ability even then like i mean i had limewire at some point so i was able to like download specific songs and albums burn them on a cd and i would have like a playlist um it's a lot easier when you have Spotify, right? And you're introduced in some weird ways to genres that you probably wouldn't even consider checking out, but maybe it was there. Maybe you just stumbled upon it. Maybe it was recommended to you. And and even though I talk about Blockbuster and that, that ability to go into a store and just go, oh, that looks cool. Pick it up, look at it. I'm going to get this. You would have never looked for it on Amazon, but here you are. But things like Spotify, YouTube, even Twitch, these platforms that we um, talk about and make content on, you're able to just stumble upon somebody playing a game that you maybe had no interest in, didn't even know existed. And so you're able to just blend all of these influences. So it's like a, it's, you know, I can see the pros and cons of each one, but um, it's, it's just a, uh, getting older man i guess i guess that's all it comes that's, down to that's, that's really what it is that's uh, really what it is they and they warned us they warned us when we were young they're like you'll be here someday <laughs> it's, like, it's like you 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 think you're with it but one day they're gonna change what it is and then it's gonna be new and confusing and scary to you <laughs> and i don't know what it was that struck a chord with me and i was like not me i'm gonna adapt to all of it you watch and to my credit uh, i do my best I do my best to keep up with everything as it comes. I want to be, I'm still around at 60 or 70. I want to be uh, playing my digital headset, flying around in VR space <laughs> with all the kids, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, and, you know, retro gaming is so popular right now, you know, and, you know, having, I, I collect VHSs and, you know, I'm waiting for those to be popular again, just like vinyl is and stuff like that. Like, I find like certain media is still just, you know oh, absolutely it's fun you know what i want to do so bad yeah they have um i i really love the gba i mean we're talking about you know getting through divorces the game boy advance got me through mm. that divorce my friend um and i they make like these backlit ones now that super shiny you know fan made obviously but it's been so many years that there are people that actually do it really impressively like super good looking zelda game boy advances with super bright backlit screens that come pre-logged with all your old games like there's so there's so many um and and lots of that you know nintendo is putting a lot of it on switch and in, in my opinion once they're on switch that no longer matters because i i actually find a lot of novelty in the switch and i i do enjoy that platform a lot um and some stuff like Sonic Battle, I've been saying for years on anybody's podcast that'll give me a platform. Nintendo, first my Sonic Battle. I don't care how many times I have to ask for it. I'll keep asking for this. That was a fun game. Please put it on the Switch. When is it coming? So retro gaming, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you all the way on that. And where's Gex? We get uh. Gex on the PSN. Is it on there? Oh, man, you might open up a can of worms with this one, dude, uh, and we can definitely get into it if you like. I, I do have a question I want to ask you, but when it comes to like retro gaming, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, well, you have a lot of things going on right now that are weird. You know, obviously, there's there was that news of Sony closing the Vita and PlayStation 3 online stores and some games you're not going to be able to get anymore. 
you know, because of that. And cause there's not physical copies or and, and stuff like that. And then you have like this weird thing with Nintendo where they know they have a library and you can get a, a, the switch online service. And I think it's like three 99 a month. Um, and they have the S N E S and like just the regular, uh, Nintendo, uh, some, some of that library, but they don't touch the 64. They don't touch the GameCube. And, um, you know, we're in this weird era of remakes and, uh, you know, obviously some deserve it. Like the final fantasy seven remake, I think is spectacular, like especially visually compared to <laughs> the original. Um, so that's a really cool update. But I feel like Nintendo's a little stingy with some of that stuff and they're very proud of those libraries. And it's a weird place as an adult for me and Nintendo. And some of the decisions that they make, I don't know if I think that they're consumer friendly. Um, there was a thing I saw earlier today that was the either the creator or somebody who was heavily involved in anybody can correct me but with f uh f zero and and they're just like well they're just waiting on a grand idea it's like some of their franchises they just don't want to touch but we'll get another mario game we'll get another zelda but it's like okay we we've already had a kirby game that you've done it this way but you have all of these other franchises and characters and games and you don't touch and it's like the rumor, and I know I'm going all over the place, but with Sony really wanting to focus on the already established uh, franchises like The Last of Us and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, this is why I enjoy that there are people that are super passionate about, you know, keeping these games as far as emulation and stuff like that. And that's a whole nother topic. But um, also uh, indie developers who you know make spiritual successors to certain games like what was it wasn't sonic mania made by you know fans or something like that it wasn't made by sega was it um it absolutely was made by fans uh christian whitehead i believe it, it, it were it was fans that were very skilled at recreating some of the levels and putting those online and in a in a genius move um sega reached out to them to handle um i believe it was the port of sonic 2 on mobile i think and um i think they did so well with that that they said hey do you guys want to do like a like a game like because you guys have made 2d sonic games on your own and um the answer was yes and they absolutely knocked it out of the park they absolutely knocked it out of the park um Excuse me. I've been a Sonic fan. Again, that's another fandom where I wasn't there. I mean, I was born the same year Sonic started releasing. Um, but in that way, I really got to grow up with him like legitimately where like Sonic, you know, uh, two came out. And I was really little playing it at a cousin's house and Sonic three came out and I was finally old enough to know what the hell I was doing. You know, and when Sonic 3 and Knuckles was out, I was starting to become a tween. And I could, you know, like I, I got to go through all these stages, like those stages, the Sonic Adventures, all that stuff, right? So, you know, Son Sonic Mania is a big hit. Like it, it's a, it's, it's an example of fans doing really, really well. An IP that they clearly also had a, it's a theme tonight that they have a lot of passion for. Passion shown through. Now, is Sonic 2006 as bad as people say it is? Because I've never played it. The one that came out on, like, I think 360 or something. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you something. Tell let me. Let me tell you something, okay? Because <laughs> uh, I hear... Let me, let, me, let me get this off my chest. Go for it. I, like everyone else, have been watching YouTubers run Sonic 2006 into the ground um, for as long as that game has existed, right? I've, I've watched uh, all these people go, oh, you guys just don't know. It's so bad. It's so terrible. Let's meme all over it. Let me tell you something. Is it terrible? Yes. You do. But let me let me let me let me under, let me help you understand how bad it is. When that game first got announced, I was working at a radio station. I spent time on the clock watching videos because they had better internet than I had at home. I spent time on the clock watching videos for the day night cycles in Sonic 06. For him getting carried by eagles to other levels. Knuckles was going to be it, and I love Knuckles. Sonic Adventure 2 was an amazing game. Sonic Heroes was a pretty good game. I was excited for this, Lucas. 
was really excited <laughs> for Sonic 2006. All right, it looked like it was going to be the, a game changer. The Sonic three and and everything that that could possibly be. And that game came out, blew off a date for that game. The theme with me, I, I literally blew off a girl <laughs> who would have uh, the beat quite graphic would have given me a much better night uh than than sonic did and i spent all night playing that craptastic game and i knew immediately i brought it brand new i brought it brand new full price retail the day it came out i had a i had it pre-ordered okay i played that game all night and eventually i just limply let my controller drop from my hand i was just like you sons of bitches <laughs> sons of bitches <laughs> quote angry joe you done fucked it up oh my god done fucked it up and i just i was like man what oh no. and 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 uh, like there's just so much about it and at this point right it's really cliche everyone has talked about it before but you guys need to understand you guys need to understand in 2006 when i was watching on a crtv and and Sonic and that human princess kissed mouth to mouth, okay? Ugh. You know, a generation of furries was born in that moment. And, <laughs> and I think Sega has some level of responsibility for creating. Absolutely. <laughs> an entire generation of furries with that moment. And I knew when I saw it, I was like, someone somewhere is enjoying that a lot. Oh, okay. 100%, dude. Yeah, Sonic definitely. Is it, is it is it bad? Oh, it's bad. It was bad at the time. It was disappointing at the time, and I knew then that there would be people one day online who were like, "Let me tell you about this game I played called Sonic 06." I've, I've never voiced my opinion on it, but there you have it. I was there. I lived through all the downs with that game. I was excited for it when it got announced. I pre-ordered it. I had like a shirt, whatever the pre-order bonus was. I had it. I was so excited terrible well i guess this terrible. would this would lead me to ask you something and this could also segue into something else that we could talk about so when it comes to that game i haven't played it but it is like you said um you know notoriously bad on the internet people talk about it trash it okay notoriously so bad so is this an example of a developer and studio involvement right you know like some people making decisions that maybe shouldn't right is this b an example of a a game a franchise trying to make a transition into 3d and it just not executing well not really doing what they would hope or, or you know something along those lines or is it just like a bad game i mean is this what happens there's, sometimes there's like a, there's a definitive answer i've been a sega fan for a very very long time you know me i see patterns the the thing with sega and most long-term sega fans know this is they continuously almost to this very day have a problem of giving these tiny windows of development time to these games and they they never push back on release dates and it has many, many times resulted in disappointing games up till this very day. They rush these things out. They come out half-baked with bugs, you know, light on content, and they just never learn. Like they are the definition of insane. The smartest thing they did in maybe the last 15 years was Sonic Generations and letting Christian Whitehead and uh, a, a fan essentially make Sonic Mania. Those were two of like their best decisions in almost 20 years. It, it is because habitually, all the time, they're like, oh, 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 look, Sonic, they got me again because I, I worked from home a couple years ago during the winter, so I had time to kill. They were like, oh, hey, guys, uh, Sonic, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, forces Sonic Forces coming out, brand new Sonic game. Look, Chaos is back from Sonic Adventure. You remember Chaos? It's like, yeah, I remember Chaos. Metal Sonic is back from Sonic CD. You remember him? Like, yeah, I remember Sonic CD. You know, they did all these things. It's, it's this big nostalgia trip. Come have fun. Okay, I'm in. Some games like Spyro, some games like Crash are doing that really well. I'm in. It's terrible. 
awful. It was another rushed game, light on content, that lasted maybe an afternoon. It was a full-priced game. And lo and behold, what do you see? What do I remember? I remember for weeks, YouTubers just taking turns, taking that thing out behind the shed and beating it with a bat, metaphorically. <laughs> just really teeing off on that game. Because again, here Sega was with, with, with you know, riding high off of like sonic generations and and what do they do same old stuff make a game give it a short window for the, the developers to to make a good game which they know they can't do they should know they can't make good games on a time crunch they have never been able to make good games on a time crunch and still they continue to do it, it it's baffling sega is people like to talk about capcom but as a sega fan for like 20 years now sega is a baffling company they 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 do sane things with these sonic games man uh, sega gave, they gave him a sword at one point i, I mean i mean <laughs> it's 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 i just think it's interesting you have obviously a money maker a beloved franchise characters and things like that and yet people still haven't learned their lesson when it comes to some executive decisions right like you said uh, they didn't want to delay it. They want to rush it out. They just want to, you know, put it together. It's Sonic. It's going to sell, right? And and that led me to think of, like, the studio involvement with, like, the Justice League. You know, like, how, how you have these properties that should do well. They have established fan bases, you know. Um, they have usually a good track record when it comes to like developers and games or actors and directors and writers and they just like i don't know in at what point in the process somebody steps in and goes ah no nah, we're gonna do it this way or no take that out or yeah you might be asking for more time no we we, we want to get this out uh you know in may and yeah maybe it would be ready in october but you got the example of like something like a cyberpunk and you got something like the redemption uh when it comes to justice league where you have these things that will be good or should be good but the execution and certain decisions made by people that make a whole lot more money than we do you know and also are living in a time a period where this is a double-edged sword, but let's just say with the ability to go on social media and engage fan and consumer responses and opinions and go, oh, okay, you know, like they didn't like this. Now you can overly course correct. We've seen that. I think the Josh Whedon Justice League is an example of that. Like, oh, everybody doesn't like how dark and gritty and mature, you know, Batman versus Superman was. We got to. We got to put some humor in there. We got to make it lighter. You know, this Zack Snyder grunge vibe, it's got to go. And we got to be like the Avengers and Marvel, you know, and then it's like Sonic is looking at what Nintendo's doing with Mario. And it's like, oh, we, we got to do 3D and we got to do it this way. And it's like, oh, I don't know if it all transitions well. Just those decisions, man, like they're they're obviously making money. But like, don't they understand that if they wait, if they do it the right way, it will make money for years and years to come. There are cult classics, there are movies and video games that people still treasure today. And I, I just, I don't understand how that, how, how those decisions are being made, man. And just look at the redemption, like with the Snyder Cut, like, oh, there was obviously a whole different vision here. There was a whole different movie and experience. Oh. You, you, you look oh, at these, yeah. You look at these games and you're like, what could have been if you would have t taken a little bit more time? You know, like, ah, it, it frustrates you, you know? It does frustrate me. And and I'll tell you what frustrates me a lot, speaking about the Snyder Cut, is that I'm a huge DC fan. I liked, um, listen, I love Marvel. We, we all love Marvel. Marvel makes great movies. I'm caught up on the Disney Plus shows. I watched Falcon and Winter Soldier. I watched, uh, uh, um, WandaVision. Uh, WandaVision. There we go. I watched WandaVision. So it's like I'm a Marvel fan too. I started with DC with Justice League in the 2000s. You know, that that those were my heroes. And I'm still like fit, uh, like 60-40 DC's way. 
So when I watch Zack Snyder's Justice League and I find out that they thought it was a good idea, cut out, I'm not going to get into spoilers here, but to cut out some of the things that they did it does make me angry. It literally makes me angry. Like I, I watched that movie once by myself, then again with friends and me and another friend of mine just kept upset at some of the things that weren't in the original version because it's like, listen, man, I get that there is a general audience for these things, but I'm literally a fan of the source material you're adapting. Like I'm here for you. I'm making a movie about characters I care about. I'm giving you a lot of leeway. As much leeway as Avengers film, Avengers fans probably gave the Avengers when that movie first came out. They probably went in there and said, listen, as long as this doesn't, you know, mess this up, I'll probably be happy with what happens here. That's how I felt going into Justice League. And when I find out that they took out things with the Flash, when I find out what they did to Cyborg's part, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me with the stuff they cut out of that that subplot? There's just God, like all I wanted from Justice League was for it to be like Watchmen because I like that film, and this version was the version that came out in theaters was trying its best to be the Avengers, and you know what? What really kills me about this is that you really only get one in the public eye. You really only get one. So Justice League came out, and to everyone, it's a joke. And now the Snyder Cut is out, and I hear everyone going, oh, well, you know, it's better than you. No, man, as a, as a hardcore DC fan for almost my entire natural life, I loved that movie. I loved it. There were so many things in that film that I never thought I would live to see happen on screen with real actors. I loved that film. That film. It's the one we should have got from the beginning. But now, it's mired in all the, the this controversy because Twitter is, it gets up in such a tizzy about this stuff and they attack people and they go after people. So now the, the whole movement is, is viewed as toxic and none of this would have happened if they would have just let it be what it was. And now they have to, to, to crush all of our dreams of seeing more of it because they're embarrassed. They want to move on because it, and, and it, it was their mistake to begin with. And the whole thing is a level of frustrating I don't think I've ever dealt with with movies before. It's like, you guys really dropped the ball. And now that you've released the thing you should have released, and fans like me, hardcore DC fans like it, moving on to other stuff. You're like mad at us for liking it. You did all of this, Warner Brothers. This was all you and your corporate executive, executive meddling. It was all super well documented how this went down. And you know, Joss Whedon has his part to play in this too. A lot is coming out about how he was on set, about the changes he wanted to make. So he's not blameless in all of this. But for other people, it's just a weird thing that happened. As a big DC fan, man, as someone who spent uh, uh, all of like last Tuesday rewatching a large chunk of the Justice League animated cartoon for fun, it's like, you guys really, really, really ruined the one shot Justice League as a movie had to come out and not be a joke. It's going to be remembered like Green Lantern now forever. Great job. Great job with your corporate meddling. Fantastic job. And you're right. It's extremely frustrating. Yeah. Especially when I look behind me and I have the original Justice League on Blu-ray behind me on a on a bookshelf. And I'm just like, what do I even do with that? I guess I just hold on to it like I have Dragon Ball Evolution just to, just to prove to myself, you know, that mistakes are um, possible. And um, you need to clean the palette every now and then. I'll watch a trash film. and But it's also weird that, that you have this version that is out now and uh how drastically different it is i mean at first when it was announced man i was a little hesitant i'm like okay the core idea should still be there but honestly when i sat down and watched it and i watched it in one night i took a break i think it was a really good idea for them to like break it up into parts and i know when it was announced for HBO Max, they were talking about doing like a mini series, and I, I don't know if it would have worked that well. It could have, but I'm glad they did it the way they did. But like you said, like two main things that were taken out, and let's be real, man. Like Justice League is a cyborg movie. 
it is and to lose all of those moments it just doesn't make sense and then the flash scene which to me was one of the best moments in the movie not only that the ending i'm not going to soil but that version compared to what we got in the original why 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 i just i don't understand companies corporations studio heads those guys and girls in their nice suits and stuff they get paid the big bucks and you know i understand that not everything's going to be a hit you know i believe in creative freedoms and you know if somebody has a vision for something let them do their thing and hey you hired him you know <laughs> like you gave Zack Snyder all the control to make the Snyder verse, right? Uh, the one thing about the Marvel movies is, yeah, the uh, Russo brothers did the Avengers and Winter Soldier, yada yada. But there was multiple different directors for all those films. And it's amazing how they all, you know, uh, sync up together, work well together. And um, it's just weird, man. It's a weird day and age because... There's a moment where I thought to myself, like, man, because I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on something. I started listening to like pop punk music again, and I used to really enjoy listening to bands like Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco, stuff like that, right? And it wasn't that cool growing up. It wasn't the go to music. And now it's kind of resurging again. But I also felt like, wow, the fourth grade version of me was super cool, man, because anime wasn't cool when I was growing up. You couldn't find anime action figures and merch at a Walmart, at a Target. It wasn't, you know, when I go to Walmart now and I go through the electronics section, there's like, you know, those display signs and there's a picture of Brawly on there. And I'm like, what timeline am I in? I just like it's it's so interesting even comic books man like we grew up watching the Batman animated series you know and um, I think like I was kind of getting older as Justice League was coming out and Justice League Unlimited uh, but those are still really good and uh, definitely worth going back and watching if you have HBO Max and uh, I think I get nervous when the things that I really like are popular because I feel like they can they can get messed up like the Justice League should have been one of the best movies ever made like just the idea like if they were to just start today and go hey we're gonna start making these movies and let's say they wanted to do the Marvel approach we're gonna start with uh, Superman kind of like they did Man of Steel came out uh, we're gonna do a Batman we'll do a Wonder Woman that's there's your trinity and then you know we can do even if they did a flash and cyborg team up buddy cop thing that would have been cool whatever because let's be honest man i i know as a 90s kid growing up i watched and and enjoyed spider-man and x-men i never really had any interest in iron man captain america yeah the hulk was pretty cool and he had his movies uh they weren't the greatest to be Frank, from my opinion, but those characters that are so popular today were not the characters that all of us were really longing for growing up. At least I didn't think so, and I wasn't. I was like, dude, give me Wolverine and Spider Man. I'm I'm all for it. And you know, if they would have just taken their time, man, if they just would have approached it, but they were just looking at their competitor and going, oh, damn it, Disney and Marvel, they got this whole cinematic universe, which I don't think needs to be a standard we have this really weird trend where everything has to be connected everything and 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 i get that you know with these streaming services which i'm gonna throw this out there there's too many there's way too many i i think hbo max actually holds a lot of its value especially when we're gonna get movies like godzilla versus kong uh mortal kombat uh yeah, Doom. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll co-sign that i'm getting a lot of value out of hbo max i got Absolutely. it for the snyder cut but they've got all the justice league stuff on there they've got all the dc animated so i'm a big fan of those and godzilla versus kong like you said now mortal kombat's coming that that one actually is kind of yeah, paying for itself oh most definitely I, I think like movie tickets are like you know range from like 
I don't know, it's just like 15 bucks to say, like somewhere around that. And that's about the price of HBO Max. So I get that they have to connect things. Like Disney Plus has their stuff that connects with the movies, all that good stuff. And then those movies eventually find their home on those services. But I don't know, man. I feel like the way that DC's kind of course correcting, like with Suicide Squad, uh, James Gunn's Suicide Squad, how it's like, ah, oh, it's got some of the same actors, but I don't know if they're even going to correlate with the other one. And now you have this whole movement, which is cool. And then it's kind of not cool, in my opinion, where it's like, well, now we need to get the, the, the original cut of the Suicide Squad and you know what happened to that Fantastic Four movie I we heard that the studios messed with that the fan four stick you know like ah it's like I don't know like hey can we just like move forward like I that's where I'm like I I appreciate that Zack Snyder had the ability to do that for his sake if anything for his sake for his reputation uh, for his family and for everything that was involved. And if you are listening to this and you don't really know about the backstory of all of that that we just talked about, I really encourage you to check it out. It's an interesting story. And um, check out the the newest uh, movie. Um, but, you know, I also wish that we would have, you know, we just move on with different things and um, hopefully learn a lesson. That's what it should be. It should be a lesson like, hey. You guys obviously don't know what you're doing when you're making some of these decisions. Like, just kind of back away from meddling with these things. Like, the Sonic movie, bro. Like, the design for that. I don't know the details, but... And I'm not going to just always point, go, it's the studio heads and it's those guys. But, you know, if you're a big fan of Sonic and you get a Sonic movie and then that first trailer comes out and you're like, oh my god, what have they done? If you're a big fan of DC you're like oh man I know I, I like Marvel but I also like I'm ready to see my you know my my Justice League out there and you you sat down in that theater and you got that you know what I'm saying yeah, just that, that was, uh, both counts exactly I was deeply, I was deeply invested in both <sighs> of those franchises and, and both of them shot me right right in the stomach oh my gosh so, it's yeah I'll tell you it really the ultimate takeaway and I, I say this as a scorned fan looking at Warner Brothers after the fact. Take away from this, including the uh, sometimes annoying movements now with the release of the cuts. All of that needs to be laid at the feet of Warner Brothers. They created this. This is their monster. This is their baby, whatever you want to call it. They, they let it get out that there was a version of the film that was different from what they released. And they released it. And guess what? I freaking loved it. And a lot of other DC fans also really loved it because the things you described are things I never thought I'd see on film. The Flash is my favorite superhero. He is my favorite superhero. I watch the show. I like Grant Gustin who pr plays the Flash on that. The idea that they thought the ending that I went to go see on opening night was better than the one at the end of the Snyder Cut makes me furious as a flash fan it mm -hmm. makes me furious it it literally is like an insult it's like well you clearly just didn't have any idea what a dc fan would want because not only did you not include things that i would have liked to see you included like cool feats that my favorite characters were pulling off you just snip that out why would you do that and so you know what yeah, now we live in a now we we live in a um a culture where people realize that executives can ruin their favorite movies with their decisions and that there may well be a version of their movie that they wanted to like sitting somewhere that isn't terrible. And that is Warner Brothers' fault. Cuz that's exactly the situation. All the decisions they made were bad ones and they disappointed just about everyone. And the, if they would have just released the Snyder Cut, there wouldn't even be a controversy to liking it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. people just would have watched it and went, well, that was pretty good. Or, oh, that could have been shorter. Or something. Not, oh, well. That was just bad. That was so bad, I'm going to make a whole YouTube career off of talking about how bad <laughs> it, it, it is. Exactly. Now, I, it, so, I guess it all leads up to this. Um, what do you think from your personal opinion, fans and creators alike, 
right? Even indie creators like us, smaller creators that do content, whether it's on YouTube, podcasts, Twitch, maybe they have their own comics, their own stories. What are the lessons that we can learn from this? Like from some of these things that we've been talking about with like Sega and, and Warner Brothers and stuff. And, and as fans, what else should we learn from this? Um, I mean, just protect what you create and just, you know, uh, don't let so many other people have the power and influence to be able to take your, like if somebody was to take Ghost Planet and, 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 and just go, you know what, man, actually, could you just remove that part from the story? And how about if you have that character do this instead, you know, like it's almost better nowadays that we have the power. You actually have the power to be independent. Yeah, yeah, we do host a lot of our stuff on platforms that we have to remind ourselves are big companies, right? Twitch is owned by Amazon. You know, YouTube is owned by Google. Uh, podcast, I mean, you got Spotify and you got Apple, right? But even hearing some of the things that uh, have been coming out about the Joe Rogan show moving over to Spotify and how Spotify uh, removed like 40 episodes from his catalog they didn't want to host it over there and, you know just kind of like oh man like you know you were better off independent this trend of musicians going you don't want to sign with a label yeah you get some money but you got to make that back and you're gonna be just put to work man like if you have the ability to remain independent do that or you also have this trend of actors directors and writers going to streaming services like Netflix, which they don't always hit, but I think they like to take chances, you know, on different things. And, you know, they don't have this stigma or this way of doing things that we've seen from other big studios and companies. Like, so it's a lesson for creators to, Hey, you know, protect what your, your vision and, and try to, you know, put yourself in a position where you have the most control and uh you know you don't let someone bully you or interfere with your vision to the point where it doesn't even resemble anything close and as fans to hold these companies uh you know accountable you know like like you said like i think the whole release the snyder cut thing the movement i guess is uh, was cool and but it also caught this really weird toxic vibe and attention from people that maybe don't understand it or even people within those movements that took it really far right so like what what do you think the lesson is here that we even us small creators can take and fans i think for as a creator because i took this away from the snyder cut when i finished it i made a conscious decision about my next episode as a matter of fact it's that you let your vision be uncompromising Zack Snyder had a vision for that universe and he laid it out for us over four hours. And while I am sure there are people who didn't like it, I'm as much of a DC fan as anyone else. I, I bleed DC comics. I loved it. It pleased me and made me happy. His vision was uncompromising and it was better, at least to me, to a lot of others. That Rotten Tomatoes audience score is really high. It, to me and a lot of others, it made the difference. As someone who creates audio drama content, my vision's normally uncompromised. Like I normally don't put something out unless I'm 100% okay with it. But as far as length, all of that stuff, I was like, you know what? Your vision needs to be uncompromising. The sky is the limit. Make, make something as big as you think it can be, as good as you think it can be, dream about it really let yourself go go wild with what you could do and if you think you can do it if you find a way to do it make it uniquely you sylvester stallone when he wrote rocky knew that was a winner and he knew he needed to play rocky he had to sell his dog to, to to even be in a position get that script to be seen by anybody i believe he sold the dog to stay in the house because he needed to stay in his house to write the script but the point is, he got that accepted by a studio. They wanted to cast a Hollywood actor as Rocky, and he said, no, take this script, you take me as Rocky Balboa. And can you can you imagine anyone other than Sylvester Stallone being Rocky? Perhaps you can, but I love Rocky, and it needed to be Sly Stallone. 
and he his vision was uncompromising did not compromise and unfortunate zach had to step away because of what happened with his daughter again go look into that um but i wish he could have it could have stayed obviously i wish what happened wouldn't have happened wish that he would have been able to release his vision uncompromised the first time because i think we would live in a different world at least in terms of superhero movies um if he would have and i'll, I'll say this too just sort of my last piece on it because we got so deep into dc people forget this um dc kind of kicks ass in everything other than movies people forget that a lot uh, those DC animated movies are amazing. I just watched uh, Apoc Justice League Apocalypse War the other day, which is essentially like an animated Justice League version of Infinity War almost. The future went bad and they lost to Darkseid and a lot of shocking things happened. It was phenomenal. It was amazing. If they would have released that in theaters with maybe a slightly bigger animation budget, I would have paid full price to go see that movie. Um. I think about the DC games, like, you know, Arkham City, uh, uh, Injustice game. I mean, come on. Like, the DC games are great. The comics are great, too. So uh, just to sort of take up for, for the home team here, um, I know DC movies cannot figure it out, right? But uh, everything else DC does is pretty cool. So I, I hope that the movies can come together soon. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with what you just said, too. Like, if you guys have not checked out any of the DC animated films and shows because I think they've done really well in that uh, department as well. I mean, one of my favorite shows growing up that still holds up today and that has like my definite version of Batman is the Batman animated version, you know, series and um, their their comics have done really well, even though they've tried to like resurge. I think what they had rebirth at the new 52 and some of the movies that the animated movies take uh, take after the new 52 in some ways. I think like some of the styles, the designs and even the stories. Um, Absolutely, they do. Yeah. I'll tell you, I didn't even like the new 52. I, yeah. I collected some of that run, but still some of the stories that came out of it, like Court of Owls and Death of the Family uh were really cool throne of atlantis for aquaman like dc had even in in new 52 which is not remembered fondly there were some really good comic art. red hood the outlaws i love that run there were some great comics in there really. yeah and you're and, right the and, tv shows are pretty good too well and like marvel is kind of slacking in every category but the mcu from what i've seen and heard i mean sure there are some highlights absolutely i mean i don't follow comics as closely as i have in the past and i think the last time i tried to collect is when rebirth happened for dc and, and some of the things that marvel was doing at that time too uh but even like you were talking about the cw uh flash but dude i don't know if you've seen this but superman and lois is fan fantastic dude it is are you kidding me it's it is, amazing it's so good uh, have you seen it yes i've seen it. Su superman is my is my second favorite hero so period. so you agree with me like it's it's really good oh, television really? yes we'll say this right now i will say this right here right now i fully understand as someone who has watched arrow from the very beginning who's seen a lot of cw get sometimes those shows can feel like they're on the cw right like they they kind of feel like that's where they belong sometimes they try your patience a bit or they're a little cheesy superman and lois it's just good tv it's it's just if you like superman you should watch that show if you don't like superman you should watch that show because it is to me the most accurate representation of superman i think had in a really long time like there's just an essence to to him because lots of people you know how it is lots of people dismiss superman they think he's boring yada yada but i i feel like for the for the mature comic reader they get that that's not true because superman like every other hero has tons of storylines and once you really dig into them he's just as interesting as spider-man or anyone else and from someone who's been deep in some Superman stories, from someone who's read and loves Superman for all seasons and stuff like that, this is some great TV, dude. It's so good. Oh, it's definitely, so good. definitely, definitely, definitely. And it, and I think it's a, it's presented in a way where, like you mentioned, like even if you don't follow these characters, even if you don't follow DC or specifically Superman, like I think it's approachable because it gives you a relatable 
Clark Kent Superman. He is trying to be a family man. He's trying to be a dad. Yeah, he can fly around the world and save, you know, countless uh, people. But can he be a good father and a good husband? And Right. A a good father to these two kids, one of whom clearly has anxiety disorders and is having trouble. I thought that was was really cool cool. that they did the twin thing. It is cool. You know what that tells me? That this show has so much potential. The fact that he has two kids tells me they want to do both the Connor Kent Superboy storyline and the Superboy Prime Evil storyline. And they can do that because the, the, the second son that has the anxiety and has trouble with his powers, I can see him becoming Superboy Prime. I see it already. And I, I can tell that the other son, who's a little more straightforward, he'd be perfect to be just Connor Kent Superboy. Mm-hmm. So they, 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 they really have all the tools to just go anywhere they want with this. And it's super promising. Really, it is. And his, uh, at first, when he, that actor was introduced as Superman, that first of all, I didn't like the costume design that they had for him. And he just, it took me a minute. But now that has like a movie budget vibe when the action happens when he's in his suit even that that really nostalgic really cool you know fan i would say a little bit of fan service when they show him in that classic suit when he's replicating that action comics you know cover when he lifts the car and he goes up to the kid and the kid's like oh i like your suit he's like thanks my mom made it you know i'm like damn this is the thing here's the thing here's how good okay here's how good that show is for like a hardcore dc fan not only did they reference the comp the, the the cover of action comics one with superman lifting the green car but then they referenced superman for all seasons with the thanks my mom made it for me which is where the hat's from so they referenced two great superman moments literally within seconds of each other and the show is full of that and i i, I can't get enough of it really so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask this and, I, and i'd like to get onto one more subject before we wrap it up for this episode man and um but with that being said, because I didn't know if you had seen it yet, and I've really been enjoying it, and I haven't had the opportunity to talk to anybody about it. Um, but do you think that Henry can become that kind of Superman that I think a lot of fans want, which is the hopeful, positive Superman? It, it, you know, for all the things that I think that Zack Snyder did. That was one of the things that I feel like was always hard. Like people don't really know how to write Superman. He wanted to take that approach where it's like, what if Superman was real and he was like a god among men? And, you know, and 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 now like this is complete contrast. It's like this is a god trying to be a man, you know, to be a father, to to be able to carry the burden of having these abilities to save the world. But how can he save you know his family from falling apart and just being there for them when he has all of these responsibilities do you think that they could bring henry back and 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 kind of you know bring that brightness that i think that i think we really need man i think from a superman you want that and i think henry was a good casting choice i honestly just don't know if the direction they wanted to take with that very realistic you know, at the beginning of the Batman versus Superman trailer, we have all these people talking about Superman and even like Neil deGrasse Tyson was on there just talking about, you know, like it, it's like, ah, I get it. And that's kind of cool. You know, it's kind of like the same fans that really enjoyed this injustice. Like what if Superman lost his mind and became a villain? But I feel like that Superman and Lois version uh, can translate and we really need some uplifting hope in, in, in after all the stuff we've been through over the last couple of years, man. And um, so do you think that they, they should recast? Because I know there's rumors right now of Michael B. Jordan being Superman and all these different things. But uh, just before we move on, I really wanted to ask you that because I like Henry and I think he does a good job in uh, as as the look and the vibe. I think if he had a, a someone who could write him well, because I've seen him in The Witcher and that was a role I was like, ah. I don't know, but I really liked him as Geralt. So, yeah, what's your opinion on that, dude? I think Henry is a very specific type of Superman, and I think he does a great job at the type of Superman that he was written to be. But, you know, Batman Begins was a very long time ago. Dark Knight was a very long time ago. Rises, same thing. Those were made specifically in that mold type of universe that those movies were is exactly what man of steel and most of the snyderverse after that 
were trying to be, it, it sort of pulls more away from that once you get to Wonder Woman and more stylistic things like that. And then it starts to become more traditional Zack Snyder fare once you're in the Batman v Supermans and, the, and all that. But uh, I think he could come back. I mean, only if it's within the Snyderverse. Only if it's within the Snyderverse. Because while I, um, I was on board or the almost deconstructions of these characters um, that Zach was going for. I'm fine with that. I've seen these characters done. I've been a fan of these comics for a long time. I've seen these characters go through all types of wacky changes. So it really didn't hurt me that much to see things like Batman killing people or Superman snapping people's necks. You know, these characters have changed a lot over a long time. And if you've read comics, you know this. So having characters be different than what you expected was nothing new. Henry is is so firmly a Christopher Nolan style Superman, to be honest. Um, no, I, 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 and I was a fan of him too. I think that time has passed. I think that Superman worked really well in the 2010s, uh, maybe, but I don't think that's the Superman we need anymore. The world has gotten a lot darker since Man of Steel came out and we have a lot more going on now you know the climate's a lot more tense the kind of Superman we need is the kind of Superman he's typically depicted as and Tyler Hoechlin is doing a great job being that Superman now we have the Blue Boy Scout and this is what he looks like in the modern day and they're doing a great job of that I liked Henry Cavill but the type of Superman he is the contemplative quiet why am I doing this? Should I do this? Do I have the right to be? All of that. There was a time and there was a place. And it's not right now. Right? It's like, Mar it, Mar it's weird to me. It's fine that Marvel is so successful. But it's very, very telling of how the last few years of DC movies have been. I saw a guy the other day talk about talking about The Boys and Homelander he said homelander is meant to be the captain america or superman of this universe and i i sort of went he is a superman allegory sir like he is a superman allegory sir like does he wear a flag and therefore he kind of looks a bit like captain america oh sure he is a superman allegory a captain america allegory there may be shades of that in there because they're both patriotic but the point of homelander and the point of Superman are man with godlike abilities and what he chooses to do with them. Captain America does not have godlike abilities. It's it, it's I, I don't that's a weird thing that irked me, but I think it's very telling of sort of how Superman hasn't been the character that a lot of us know him to be for a very long time. The fact that people look at home, some people look at Homelander and think Captain America before they think Superman tells me a lot. Yeah, definitely. Lot. And the boys is a great show too, by the way. So um, man, and I, I and I need to catch up on uh, Invincible, um, because I have not watched anything other than the first episode, and I would love to talk to you about that. Just even off off air, man, just to kind of geek out about that whenever you get the chance, man, because I think it's uh potentially a really good show. And um, so one of the last things I want to talk about, because we've talked about nostalgia, we've talked about um video games, comic books, you know, a lot of different things, but I couldn't end this episode without talking about some anime. And uh, I know that you love your Tanami. We both are big fans of a lot of these stories and characters from anime and manga. And I just have reached this weird frustration and I would like to get your advice. And I think this advice would be good for uh, people new to these um, stories and characters and stuff. So I've recently, now I'm a huge fan of My Hero Academia. It's like my favorite anime manga at this time, right? Um, recently, over the last three plus months, I caught up, I had held back, I caught up. Now, what I mean by that is the manga is out there and it's ahead, it's like the comic books it's ahead and there's the anime which is the show uh so i read ahead and now i'm in this world of uh the fifth season for my hero academia just came out 
and it is uh, if if we were to really break it down probably a couple years behind where the manga is and then on top of that I'm watching season five and I actually prefer the English dub now like I'm not always that way like this say for example Demon Slayer I really love the sub I love the voice actors in the uh, sub version and that's how I was introduced sometimes that's how it works for me depends on which version I see first um, so I don't mind that but I'm in this weird frustrated place with that kind of fandom where I told myself I had to read ahead so I wouldn't have it spoiled now we both know a lot of people on social media and just in general friends that are you know up to date with a lot of these stories and uh you know they talk about them freely so you kind of don't want to avoid them you don't you don't want to tip around you know tip around and and not want to interact or you know any of that but you also are afraid to get something spoiled if you don't read it or watch it the moment it happens or it releases and it's just kind of in a frustrated place with uh being a fan because i'm like i'm reading one chapter a week of the manga which is now years ahead in the story um i prefer the dub version but now that's two weeks behind the initial release of the show that comes out in japan so now i'm watching the subbed and then i go back and watch the dub it's like why does it have to be so complicated like i just feel like it, it, it's really hard to <sighs> be a fan sometimes because there's some moments where i'm like okay i like knowing what's happening on a week-to-week -week basis some of these episodes are about what 24 minutes some of these chapters are not very long and and to eat those and digest them like on a week and sometimes even longer like i think dragon ball super is coming out on a once a month basis with the manga and dude like the show hasn't come back for now a couple years so it's just like what, what advice do you have for people to navigate through here where it's like what if i wanted to just be an anime only fan but then you know how social media and youtube twitter works it's like oh kenny we know that you like you know my hero academia we're gonna start putting things through the algorithm that show you thumbnails or tweets or things that reference that thing that you like right because you like it and we want you to stay here but then it's like Oh, well, I might get spoiled. And I'm very protective of just a few things. Like, I know what's going on with the Falcon in Winter Soldier, and I haven't watched it. But it's almost inevitable. That's kind of how it worked with WandaVision. Um, but I'm just, like, at a weird crossroads with how I approach this and still enjoy it to the max with having to go through these complicated pass of enjoying it it's like oh well you could watch the sub or the dub or read the manga but the manga is this and, and it's like how do you introduce people to it when everything is so complicated oddly if you're a fan of these things and you live in the west so like how do you navigate through that man and do you have any advice for newcomers or even fans currently like i've been holding back on demon slayer i plan to watch the movie but i already know that it's um I think it ended right and and they're like either way they're ahead in the manga and like with attack on titan something that i recently just binged so i i really enjoy it but i'm also like oh my gosh the manga just ended and uh, the anime just kind of left us on a cliffhanger for the rest of it so how do i avoid the spoilers to the show that i'm invested in you know with with the information out there like it's just weird I don't know what to do. Yeah, I, I don't. I, okay, so I, I don't really know. I, I guess it sort of depends on your level of involvement in social media. Obviously, people like you and me are on it every single day. So we, we're we just going to be spoiled. It almost comes with the territory. Um, a couple of things. The, the first thing is, I think, and I've had to be this way, think you have to get to the point where you enjoy media in such a way that it being spoiled isn't the worst thing for you. I really do just think that more people would be happier, especially with the way things are going with tech and with Twitter and with Instagram. It's like no one cares. People will spoil it. All right. We, we learned with these Marvel shows that 
you have a little bit of time to get that watched. And if you didn't, you will be spoiled if you're online. Like it, it happened for me with WandaVision, even just an episode I hadn't caught up on yet. Like it does not, it does not take long and it pro will probably happen because no one cares and no one's paying attention to what you, know, you uh, random person has or has not consumed. So the first thing is I think relationship with spoilers and our, 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 our our coveting of these moments we want to have so organically, I think we'll all just be a lot happier if we embrace the fact that the digital age doesn't really allow for that much. And we need to find ways to still derive enjoyment from these experiences without it depending on us having, or, you know, not knowing anything about it necessarily, especially with anime. I mean, listen, th th there, there are things that, ha are there things that happen in anime that are so cool that, that you, maybe you wouldn't want them spoiled, sure. But did someone telling me in like fourth or fifth grade that Gohan beat Cell ruin that incredible episode for me? Oh, absolutely not. And I, I think you have to be that way. Um, with, an, with anime, <laughs> one of my best recommendations is to read the manga. Read the manga. They're like, oh man, I really like this. Go read the manga. Go read the manga, get current on it. Nothing will spoil you then. I mean... Will it be tricky to keep current with that at a point? Yeah, sure. But you won't be spoiled because even if something comes out from the anime that you didn't know happens in the anime, you knew it happened in the manga. It's not its not that bad of a spoiler. R really, all it comes down to is adaptation. None of these things are going to change about the world. They aren't. This is the way things are. And if you want to exist comfortably while still being a part of the social discourse and on social media, but still also enjoy these things. I think just the way that we interact with them and the, the way we get our enjoyment with them has to change. You know, like you can, if the anime is great, the anime is great. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to be sitting there um, and with your popcorn in hand every time a, a big thing happens. You know, for people who grew up watching Dragon Ball Z, you know, even if you heard about it at school or something, it didn't really diminish how much enjoyment you got out of it. I think we need to remember that. Yeah. Often. Yeah. Hopefully. Again, it's not going to change. Like, this is just the way it is if you're plugged into social media. It's not going to change. No one's going to suddenly start caring about spoiling things for you. People were spoiling those those Marvel shows the, the day it happened. The day it <laughs> happened, you would hear people all, all over Twitter going, oh, I can't believe... I can't believe this was the thing. It would be trending. It'd be right there when you locked into the app. Spoilers, big, big, bold letters. I don't know. Eventually, you just get a little desensitized. And you're like, oh, really? That happens? That's cool. I can't wait to see that. It's one thing to read about. It. It's another to see it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. And because I, I, and even if like, because I know how much of a supporter and how involved you are with like Tanami and, and, and just seeing how they're, behind with certain things that might be on a crunchy roll or funimation and stuff so so if you're only watching tanami right like you're going to run into that risk and i think that's just like the day and age that we do live in i guess you know it was just really interesting to get your perspective on it man and just given how different this medium is because you know wanda vision and you know all these marvel dc stuff here in the west they're they're influenced and they're not page panel for panel adaptations of the comics so you could read the comics and go well in the comic version of civil war this happened right you know um so but with the manga anime you know, uh, universe, it's, uh, usually pretty spot on uh, unless you're the promised Neverland uh, season two. And that's a whole nother thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it's just, it's new territory. Cause for so long, I held back from reading ahead in, in my hero academia, which if you guys have never checked that out, I definitely encourage you to do so. I'm a huge fan of that. And, uh, uh, you know, I had to avoid spoilers. I also had a, a buddy of mine that I got into the the show and, and the stories and he would read ahead and he'd be like, man, you got to read ahead so we can just talk about it and geek out about it. And I'm, I'm happy that I have and I love seeing 
um, those panels come to life when I watch the anime, but also enjoy seeing the original art and story. And, uh, you know, but like with an anime versus the manga, especially with something with action, you know, uh, it's really crazy seeing that on the screen. And I, me specifically with my hero, it's the music, it's the voice acting. There's a lot of different things. It's like if we took your, your podcast, your stories with Ghost Planet and you had a, a novel version and then you had like the audio drama or movie ver you have all these different versions of the same thing which one would be the preferred way is there a preferred way to uh enjoy it um you know i i think you're you're right about just like the way we interact with things and it, it's different for everyone but um before i let you go uh, on, on that subject of anime and stuff man like what are you are, what are you watching lately like what it, what are the the stories that you're mostly involved in and and even outside of anime and manga and stuff like that man what is catching your attention and do you have any suggestions uh for people to check out that maybe you don't see a lot of people talking about um, lately, I've been kind of riding the wave with everyone else as as these hot things come out, Godzilla versus Kong, the Snyder Cut, you know, um, uh, Mortal Kombat coming out now. Uh, it's been an interesting time here lately because we do have all these fun things dropping that everyone is is taking notice of. And I'm a big fan of it like everyone else is. You know, I've been a Godzilla fan for, oh God, pretty much my entire life, man. So that was a big one. And um, I think what else am I? am I watching besides these Marvel shows and all this stuff that everyone else is watching right now too, because we, I feel like we're, we're, we're all at about the same place with, with our entertainment where people have, yeah. have just started dropping this stuff for us. And it's like, Oh, cool. There's a new thing to consume. I'd better consume it. Um, but you know, I, I, I was doing a lot of reading recently, just going back into to old stories and old literature. I, I spent, um, this is going to be, not as entertaining as some as some cool new TV show, but I really got back in touch with my J.R.R. Tolkien roots uh, a month or two ago. I, I really did some deep dives into um, Silmarillion and the actual Lord of the Rings text and Lost Tales and things like that because uh, you know I, Tolkien really really inspired me to start writing and to to build a world and to build it meticulously and carefully. It was really refreshing just to go back and be reminded just how seriously he took all of his work and um you know how much of his family he involved as he was coming up with it how much that paid off because we're still here talking about it all these years later and uh really it, it, as far as watching tv I, I have been going back and not to get on dc again but i've been going back and watching a lot of old dc stuff and catching up on the dc animated movies that i've missed um, i enjoy those quite a bit um, because a lot, lots of stuff, you know, Ghost Planet does have sort of a a, a superhero quote unquote team that that comes together called the Midnight Crew, but it's it's very different from anything like an Avengers or Justice League, and that no one's wearing capes or anything like that. Like it 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 is a team of superheroes in that they're a team of people doing superhero like things, but. You know, no one's calling it that so it, it it's nice to get to sort of relax in a universe it has a type of camaraderie i really like and i really like this about um let's call it the bat family batman and his uh his charges his his wards you know robin nightwing uh red hood uh, red robin batgirl all all of these characters that carry the bat name um there's a lot of a real minutia that goes into their relationships with one another and i really i've really enjoyed lately going back and watching these these dc movies where you get a lot of that son of batman and, and things like that where you, where you really get to see these characters who wear capes and cowls sort of interact with each other i feel like right now the, the current zeitgeist it's really popular because we've had so many years of successful marvel movies sort of deconstruct that and make all these evil versions of characters um, which leads to a lot of, oh, this is how they would really be. It's like, I don't think so. It's like, I, I, I think this is how they would be if the circumstances were as these different shows make them. You know, The Boys, I'm, I've am i read The Boys comic. I, I, I know the full story of The Boys. Um, 
boys is not this is how superman and blah 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 and all of them would be if they were real that's not the story the boys is the boys is this is how heroes would be if they were controlled by corporate overlords all the way down to how they were created in the first place and their creation has a lot to do with why they all act the way that they do so i've been enjoying sort of taking a vacation in superhero media that is still pretty uplifting um still pretty hopeful uh and 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 has a lot to say but doesn't feel like it needs to shock you or or beat you over the head with the idea that superheroes aren't so great because how could they be because we are not great and they're just us i'm kind of wearing out with that narrative um as far as anime i'm actually on a bit of a break right now i mean there's just been so much live action stuff coming out i hate to say this i do but the the more ghost planet has gone along um obviously we do still support tsunami and i as a person do still love anime but anime has just become a smaller and smaller part of what we do and it's just because um gosh this will be controversial we can talk about it it's it's that I take so much care in the writing and the crafting of the world and the characters and all of this and all the people that inspire me have done the same it's that a lot of anime is repetitive and unfortunately um, just is a lot of it's really repetitive the same tropes pop up everywhere especially in shonen and it really doesn't matter the genre like anime has been going anime is so popular at the moment and we're getting so many different versions of the same type of thing it all feels a little saturated for me um kind of waiting for like i don't know like promise neverland was really good i enjoyed that i thought that went interesting places but i'm hearing bad things about the next season of that so i don't know um fire force sort of had me but then it lost me because that show went in kind of a fairy tale direction and full disclosure i don't really enjoy the fairy tale direction and I hate to say this because I'm on a podcast with you, but I think my hero is pretty overrated at this point. Um, not bad, but I, I kind of think a lot of the shine is, or a lot of the blooms off that rose at this point. It was a tremendously huge cast, and it's just kind of getting lost in the weeds a bit with all these characters. And I feel like that a lot of the times they focus on things no one wants to see. I could be wrong there, um, but that's just my read on it. So kind of waiting for something interesting something avant-garde a a series like a cowboy bebop or a samurai champloo or a ghost in the shell there may be a series like that out there and i just haven't stumbled upon it yet but i need something that sort of shake things up and challenges the mold that isn't just a another shonen anime sort of going through motions uh and 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 black clover clover got better that was an anime that i didn't care for and it it got better as it sort of fleshed out its cast a little more and embraced its inner one piece um even even that i'm kind of you know one piece is is one i've been thinking of jumping into though uh that huge series but at the moment with anime i've been watching a lot of this live action stuff uh Mm -hmm. and, and going back to older storytellers to sort of learn how the masters did it and I think, fortunately, the deeper you are into some real literature, into some some actual literary study, uh, kind of the less entertaining anime tends to be. I think you need to be in a certain mood. You need to be in the mood to consume some kind of really straightforward content. Um, but that's me at the moment. That's just <laughs> honest answer. No, and that's exactly what I wanted to hear, man, is just I knew you were going to be honest. And I know, hey, man, we go through different modes and and, and uh, trends and stuff like that. What you might be into today might not be what you're into tomorrow. Like I, 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 I from someone who likes such a variety of things, whether it's fantasy, superheroes, uh, sci fi, anime, whatever, you know, so you, you, you talk to me every week and I'll probably have a different answer for you. So I totally understand, man. And I think, um, you know, just the stuff that you did mention that you have been getting into, you have every good reason to be. And uh, there is a lot of anime out there right now. And um, I, I, I can't really defend a lot of things that you said and i don't think it was uh, an attack at all i think it's just like observations so i feel like um 
it's okay to take breaks from things and 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 you know i hope that you're right about something coming out because i can see what you're talking about from a certain point of view and but uh, i really i really enjoy the live action stuff that's been coming out too man and um hey man it's all good i hey if you were to tell me right now you're like dude my hero academia is the worst thing i've ever seen we would still be friends we're still cool bro i <laughs> I, I still look i i respect your opinion everyone's entitled to it and uh and you know I, what it is it, it's like the character design is that show strong suit i think it, it really has great character design and it, it's done a really good job at having a ton of different characters but think just for me it's not even like a bad thing for some people this could be a positive it's it's that he has really doubled down almost like pokemon on like going hey here is this world and well he, more re, more more accurately here's japan in this world and here are just dozens just dozens of heroes within it and fandoms have popped up around like every single one of them and that's a testament to the character design and to making the most i suppose out of the the little amount of time on average each one of those characters is given uh where, where it falls off with me is as someone who is more conditioned to something like a justice league it's like my man you need to wrap that up you need to pick a number circle it and that's how many characters are in this story so that you can go real deep into all of them because what you end up with when you get a cast the size of my hero academia is you run into episodes where deku's chasing gentle criminal and la brava and i i gotta be honest with you don't care and it's been like three episodes of it and it, you just you have so many characters that inevitably are going to focus on on, on a subsection of them um where the people that are watching that week are fans of them you know, if some people don't like Bakugo and you have a full Bakugo episode, you're not going to want to watch those episodes if they're all about Bakugo. I think a unique thing my hero can run into is because there are so many characters, they can have an episode about a group of characters you don't want to see. It's just a whole nother level. It's like, oh, so this is like a Mina, uh, 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 Hiroshima uh uh what's the guy with the tail i don't even know like it, it's like an episode <laughs> about these three okay well i'm completely checked out like i'm 200 i i could not be asked to care about what their group is doing right now and those moments pop up in the arcs like there'll be a tournament arc where where um I'll be honest it was a good fight when when uh uh, uh ochiko fought bakugo that was a pretty good fight i could have done without it I could literally have done without that episode in its entirety you, you could have hinted that it didn't go well. You could have had her walk out there and the next thing we see is her it laying in a bed in a stretcher and we would it would have accomplished the same thing. And I, I, I literally, she is my best girl. I could have completely done without that episode. And I think my hero gets there more often than some other shows do because its cast is so big. I think they, they, they gotta, gotta stop introducing like five new characters every, it's just so much yeah that's I, my, I, my soapbox on it no no dude and, and it's good man i i i understand I, and i feel like if it, if 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 anything i could say without getting into detail is that i feel like shonens are trying to learn from previous ones i feel like pacing has gotten better at some points and i also feel like they're getting shorter like attack on titan ending demon slayer ending the rumors that my hero is going to be wrapping up soon i think does better for storytelling hopefully because there is that intimidating factor of a one piece and things like that where the worlds just continue to expand and um you know it, it it's just like for me it's just a different approach because with the justice league or the avengers these are all individual characters that have their own worlds and they're the that is a unique situation of them being brought together for a story or a show where like most of these like dragon ball any of the a lot of these animes that's their story it's it's and those are the uh, characters involved and especially with like uh, academia like where they're at a school right it's kind of like a harry potter thing there's a ton of characters because you're in this realm 
Um, and as it goes forward, you do see it start to narrow, but obviously you're going to have fan favorites, even if they, I mean, look at Bubba Fett, dude. I mean, that dude he barely had any screen time and became a fan favorite. So there's always some character out there, even if they have one or two lines that gets a fan uh, invested and goes, that's the one I like. I like for whatever reason. And, um, you know, it's, I just look at things like Justice League different because you have the, all those characters that are together as a team each have their own stories and comics and movies and universes full of uh, their branch of characters. So they, 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 when they're told in that moment, it's like, we respect that. Yeah. You know, that Batman has all of these villains and all of his sidekicks and stuff, but here it's Batman with Superman, Wonder Woman, all them. So it, it's just like, Justice League is a branch off of those individual stories with those worlds where like an anime most of the time has to go here is the one story and here's all the characters and we might take a time to go focus on this person or focus on this group here because there is a moment that's going to come up in the anime for my hero where it focuses on a group that people might not be totally you know expecting and it's going to be like huh what you know but um yeah, but i understand sure. and, and inevitably, I, uh, and, yeah and inevitably with that there, there, there's going to be people who who don't because i hear what you're saying and it's like you know you know what i think it is and i've said this before but i don't i don't think i've ever said it talking to you it's that i feel like my hero academia is anime manga which whatever you want to call it i think it is it is japan's take on a, a ensemble superhero show I think it is their take on a justice league i think it is their take on an avengers assemble and i think it is wrote with every trope that something like that would be filled with i yeah. mean it, it 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 is to me those shows through the lens of an anime it's exactly what i would think that would be the the only and i said this too to others the only thing and this is 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 just i think i think they took the parts of it that are anime Right. The parts of it that are anime because it has to be and, and there's tradition and there's an expectation, you know, oh, char character accidentally touches boob, show exterior building, play loud scream, cut to next scene. You know, stuff like that is in every single anime, ad nauseum in every single one of them, because it's just part of that anime culture, it's something that people who watch this in Japan expect almost to be there. I get it. I, I feel like they took weird lessons from it. And, and to, to, to go off what you're saying, you're 100% right. Justice League, you know who Superman is and Wonder Woman and all these people. And you know that they have all their own stuff going on outside of their adventures together. Yes, that's the key. That's the key. These are superheroes. Frost um, from Ghost Planet has multiple villains that only care about him. The Sniper, Kepler, Vanner, these these are characters whose deal is I hate Frost, and it's a problem, and I'm gonna deal with him. So many of my characters, um, I have a I have a character. She's a time racer who who has speedster powers named Bunny, has a villain called Paramore in her city, who's like a socialite fashion model. Like you you have to do that. There's a there's a blueprint for this stuff, and it's been laid for a reason. So. so my hero focuses on a, an, an interesting period of time, the same way that like Gotham Academy, the comic did, and that these are in, in, in the way Teen Titans did, and that these are characters coming into their powers. And it, it, it has a very X-Men like vibe sometimes too, yeah. because the teachers play a very Professor Xavier role, as opposed to being the heroes that save the day. I like all of that about it. Really, the only thing, and it's just such a prominent thing, is the only issue. Really, is that they—it's—it's it's my one thing, but it's very prominent. Is that because there are so many characters, I almost don't buy that they're having adventures outside of what I'm seeing. They must because I, they must because they must be. But the story itself, you know, doesn't does. I mean, because all these guys exist within Japan. This is one one city, one big. One country, all this is happening in, and it all seems like it's happening within like the same place, and 
I don't really get a sense of what's going on in America or, or, or the greater world at large. It all feels like, and again, this is an anime thing. All animes kind of do this. It feels like this is all happening in a very small area. And there are so many people in this area. They can't all, I mean, there are only so many villains. Like these guys have a huge league and it's all very regulated, which makes sense. Um, and I don't know, like it, it, it's just, they, they've gotten some really anime things into the formula. I, I, I think they spend so much, it'd be like if Justice League Unlimited was only about the Justice League and they never fought the really memorable villains. Because I think outside, and maybe you can uh, uh, sort of push back on this, I think outside of um, the, our main guy with the hands, I always forget his name, I think outside of him, uh, the villains in My Hero are kind of whatever. And I, I'm not trying to go hard at this. It's my observation. Uh, and I've been watching it too. It's like, it's, it's a great anime, but there are things they could do better. Like, I don't feel like, I feel like All Might's moment, he when he does what he does with uh, All for One, how that all plays out, the coolest moments in anime, I think. Um, I think that moment and his part of it, complete, it, 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 it carries what was otherwise a pretty whatever villain you know like i expected more from that guy but it all went down really cool so i guess to sort of tie it off you know my hero is is an interesting beast because i think it does a lot of things really well i think it has a lot of unique problems that come because it's an anime trying to tell like a big multiple superhero story it's interesting to see it all play out it's it, it's super interesting it's a very interesting series um yeah, no, dude, dude, you're good, bro. Like, it, it's completely fair. And the, and the way I look at these things, and um, and we could go on, but I'll, I'll, I'll the only thing I'll say to that is, when whenever we're watching, and I do this with my buddy, who if he ever listens to this, uh, I would tell this to him. Like, he's always trying to put it all together, you know, with what details we have and what what information we're provided. And I always think to myself, like, ah, man, what would I think of Darth Vader? If all I saw was him fighting Obi-Wan Kenobi on the Death Star, like, eh, that's, that's whatever. You know, I just feel like with any ongoing story, regardless, it's really hard to look at it for what it really is until it's complete. It's always a work in progress and they're going to be uh, mistakes and maybe some moments where you're like, yeah, the gentle criminal stuff and that whole basically filler arc. Eh. And I would even as someone who's a fan i didn't really care for last season compared to is that what that was what was that filler yeah it was a filler man they they had the festival yeah. it, that's pretty much it. but that's why it's hard to talk with context because now that i've read ahead and everything that you've talked about i almost want to tell you hey man right around the corner my guy i promise you but but then it's like we are watching this develop and everybody with anime specifically everyone's in different places you know, oh, well, I, I, I'm watching season five, but I'm watching the English dub. So I'm only on episode one where everybody else is on episode three. Oh, well, I'm, I'm reading the manga. So I'm like, if we were to break these down into seasons, like I'm two or three seasons ahead. So that's like years ahead. It's crazy to think about. But but given the certain context of how the story has developed and what they've done, um, you know, it's just like I said, man, like you have that villain, you have certain villains but it's it's especially with superheroes bro it's like what moment would you pick just for the joker you know like if we know the joker as a collective out of all of the stories and the different ways that he gone up against not just batman but his moments with the justice league and different stuff so it's um it's completely okay because i have ha i've had struggles now being caught up with the manga watching the pacing of the animes and going dude anime is meant to be binged it's almost like made for the cliffhanger i i made a tweet the other week or so and i said animes that start off the first five minutes recapping the last five minutes of the last episode deserve a special place in hell because you're only you you, you got 24 minutes usually runtime. Yeah. You use an outro and intro, and then that. 
what are you getting if you're watching this week to week? Like 10, 15 minutes? Like it's almost a struggle reading the story like as the manga chapters once a week and sometimes they get delayed, which happened recently. And where everything is, is like, dude, I don't know how to put this together. But, you know, certain content, it's best to be able to just go, let me roll through it because that's where the grander story is. But being able to look at everything from bit by bit is kind of hard and sometimes does it more harm than good. Like I was actually in a weird place um, with my hero a couple weeks back. I'm like, I don't know if I like what direction we're going here. But now fast forward about a month later and we're getting that context. We're getting like, oh, 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 okay. Now when I look back at it, I can look at it differently, but I totally understand, man. And it's something I'm learning, especially with all types of mediums. Like, I don't know, will the Falcon Winter Soldier be better if I just binged it and watched it like almost like a mini movie? Or does it hold up like that week to week, one episode at a time chunk and giving us that week to marinate and overthink and go, well, what's what's this mean? Who is this character? What's going to happen here? Because that's what we like to do with a lot of this uh, entertainment, man. But I totally understand, man. I've been in and out of anime. I've been in and out of fantasy sci-fi. I go through my motions and um, I know that you're just... You know, you're being honest and you're uh, you're not being negative, bro. You're just telling it how it is, how you feel. And I, I respect that. So it's all good, Kenny. Don't worry, bro. You didn't lose a friend after you just trashed my favorite thing in the world. Ah! No, I'm just kidding, bro. You know, hey, it's good. I'm, it's good. I'm, still a, I'm still a hardcore Shoto Todoroki fan. I'll say this, man. <laughs> like one, one, we share a birthday, which is very cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah, he's my favorite character. We have the same birthday. That's legit. And two, um, he has dad issues. I mean, me and my old man are fine, but for a long time, we actually had a very similar relationship. Um, so I, I'm still willing to give the show a lot of leeway. It has a character I, I like a lot, and it does cool things with him sometimes. And they actually have been developing uh, his arc and en Endeavor's arc, and that's kind of neat. So there have been some cool things. I'm not Absolutely. completely off with it. I feel you, bro. He, he, dude, I just finished Avatar The Last Airbender for the first time, dude. And for so long, people have been like, that's the best show ever. And hyping it, hyping it, hyping it up. And it's only three seasons. There's a lot of influences there that are in my hero. Zuko is like Todoroki. Uh, you know, there's different things that the main character Aang, the airbender, does that I see in Deku. Yeah. So you see the influences there, but... It's, um, you know, looking at different things, I, I can tell like in the moment people watch that show and we're like, man, this is amazing. And it is. And I think it held up. I give it an eight out of 10. Boom. There's my rating. Yeah. But, but I'm also just kind of like, you know, Hey, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Like I, 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 I don't think I, you know, even if I'm not in love with something, you know, it's like, okay, I can understand why you would like this or, you know, you do you, I'm into this, you're into that. We're all good. You know, so. what, you know, what, you know, as a, as a creator, I think the the one cool thing, because uh, lots of people, it, it's not a unique thing for our someone in our generation to love Avatar: The Last Airbender. We all grew up with it. I did too. You did. We all did. I, I get you're just watching it now, but you, I'm sure it was on in a t on a TV yeah. in the background at some point. Yeah. But I grew up glued to it. Watched it all through, you know, like middle school and then through summer high school until it ended. And coolest thing as a creator about that series is it demonstrates that you can have mostly eastern influences in your creation in your your inspiration and you can do those justice in a way that everyone enjoys and that is something basically you can be from the west and make something clearly inspired by anime that is an anime and it can be really good i really it's like that inspiring. i'm glad i'm glad you said that dude thank you <laughs> like inspiring. yeah it, it's really cool because I, I totally uh can get behind that man and if you guys haven't seen avatar the last airbender check it out it's on netflix all these all these services that we've been plugging in this episode man please hit us up uh you got the contact information for kenny and ghost planet where you can find all of his content in the description so if hbo max wants to hit him up or me up or anybody netflix i know you guys are listening just kidding none of them are but if in one you know universe or timeline that they did and hit us up that would be really cool maybe it's this one but i do want to say man 
I I know we could talk for like years, bro. Like we can just go off. We have so many different interests, so many uh, different things that we can just talk about. We um, just always have great conversations, man. And I want to make sure that I give you an opportunity here at the very end um, to uh, plug yourself, man. Tell everybody what's going on with what you're doing as far as content with Ghost Planet, uh, what to expect. And like I said, everybody, when you hear him tell you that, check out the description in the episode, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. But check out Kenny and Ghost Planet Studios. Uh, Go ahead, man. Do your thing. Absolutely. So Ghost Planet is entering a very cool stage where we are transitioning into a lot of uh, very unique ideas as as far as how to expand and bring a lot more of what we are to you guys. I mean, we're we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram's Ghost Planet Studios, Ghost Planet TV on on Twitter is the handle. Um, But like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, you know, we do do audio dramas. We've got a good bit of that stuff out now. We're sort of finishing out. Um, our first big story arc been working on that for some time but trying to sort of get that out in different ways and that is setting up an ongoing web comic called the midnight crew um, which are essentially the stories of a planet that gets broadcasts from earth Uh, they really enjoy our media and they like our culture uh, but they don't have any heroes of their own and they need some and the the midnight crew is the story of how uh, a ragtag bunch of synthetically and cybernetically enhanced beings go from being freaks and rejects to the heroes of ghost planet and ushering in a a new age of of hope this entire place and that story is going to be told through web comic um these cards we mentioned the the digital tcg sector uh sector saints is in universe so characters in the universe know about it and play it i mean it also exists for us and we'll be releasing new boosters um are essentially collections of character cards uh different art for different characters whether they've been in the story or not like we're just interesting characters cool characters from the lore of ghost planet will be coming out in these packs sometimes they'll pertain to the comic or to the uh, the drama episode coming out but lots of times they'll just be hey here's a cool guy that controls time here's his deal and how much damage he does and and as we sort of move into that we want to do an animated youtube channel also taking place on ghost planet we're making strides towards all these things to take it to the next level so the setting becomes a household name and maybe someday much as we like to joke around these companies like hbo or something go wow that's really really cool over there i wonder if we poured money on that fire would it get bigger the answer is yes the answer is yes if, if you if you are, are are looking for money and success and invest in ghost planet because <laughs> we're going we're going to cool places and i really can't wait i really can't wait to get some of these awesome ideas stories and characters out there yeah me too man and shoot your shot dude let's go for it we might as well man let's get it um i'm i'm so happy every time we get a chance to talk man and i know we stay in contact off air and um, I really appreciate that. I know that we've developed a, a pretty cool friendship through uh, our shared passions and interest and in doing content. Um, so I really appreciate you, man. And I so enjoy having you on the show. And I know we'll have an opportunity to talk again because there's still so much um, I would have loved to get, you know, to talk to you about. But I also feel like, hey, man, just another reason for us to sit down geek out have a conversation and uh just connect man and i hope everyone who listened to this episode i know it's a little bit longer but i really hope we were able to keep you entertained um please take the opportunity check out kenny ghost planet studios on all the platforms and all the links that you will need to do that will be at the bottom uh depending on when you're or where you're you know taking this content in uh but definitely check out uh the podcast and everything he does is so good man and thank you one last time for being on the show man i really appreciate you dude and i can't wait to see what you come up with because i am a huge fan of everything you do dude it's been a pleasure see you around ghost planet